Father, we're so thankful that you are the Lord of all. You are the name above all names. You came down from heaven to provide a way that we can be forgiven of our sins and have fellowship with God. We're so thankful for that, that you demonstrated the Father to us, you revealed the Father to us, and yet you were willing to be the sacrifice for our sins, to die on the cross so that we could have everlasting life. Thank you for that. And thank you that you rose from the dead and you're now at the right hand of the Father praying for us. And Lord, we need you to pray for us. We need prayers today, Father. You know uh, so many in our congregation with physical difficulties needing you to be their great physician. We lift them up to you. Others, Lord, who are carrying heavy burdens and need you to be their strength. Some, Father, facing decisions and aren't quite sure what to do and need you, your wisdom. Some of us facing financial challenges and we need you to be our provider. We're so thankful that whatever it is that we need, you've told us to pour out our hearts to you. You've told us to ask, and we're asking, Father, for what we need today. We thank you for this time of the year that we're getting ready to enter, where we celebrate, and the whole world celebrates the coming of your Son. Help us to keep focused on the main thing, the real thing, the truth of Christmas, that God so loved the world that he gave us his Son, so that if we would believe in him, we wouldn't have to perish, but could have everlasting life. Thank you for that. We thank you again that you're interested in everything that's going on in our lives. And so we lift up our brothers and sisters to you. We realize that around the world there are brothers and sisters in the family of God whose lives are at risk simply because of their faith in you. We lift them up to you. We, we've been reminded, Lord, even this week that um, men and women of our military are putting their lives in harm's way and we lift them to you. and. We pray your, your comfort on those who are grieving this week. And Lord, there may be some of us who are here or some who are uh, joining us online who are grieving today, who are going through a difficult time. I pray for your peace and your comfort in the midst of the pain. Lord, we've come today to remind ourselves that God loves us, that he cares about us, that he's interested in everything going on in our lives. And so I pray that you would help by our spiritual senses to be alert and awake to what you would say to us today so that when our time together is over this morning we can say I'm glad I took the time to go to church because God spoke to me and for those who watch us online father I pray you blessing on their lives as well we thank you that you're our provider that everything we have comes from you and we give you now your tithes and our offerings asking you to bless and multiply them through Christ our Lord amen our scripture lesson today comes from John chapter 17. We have been several months studying the life and the teachings of Christ. And that particular part of this series will be wrapping up today as we look at his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane or before he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane that we typically call his high priestly prayer, John 17. I remember as a, as a young man, attending prayer meetings with people who were, in my estimation, really spiritual giants. Now, I grew up in a church setting where everybody prayed out loud, where the person was leading in prayer, but other people were praying out loud at the same time. And if you were at certain prayer meetings, people would scatter throughout the church, and they would each be praying out loud uh, where they were. And what I would try to do as a young person was kind of walk around and listen to some of these people pray. And there is nothing like listening to a saint of God pray. Somebody that's been living for God for 50 or 60 or sometimes 70 years and listen to them pray. You just felt like you were on holy ground and you were. But imagine getting up close to somebody and eavesdropping on their prayer, and all of a sudden you begin to realize, this is Jesus I'm listening to. And not only that, he's praying for me. That's what we get in John 17. We get a chance to eavesdrop on Jesus praying and praying for us. Now, the first eight verses, he prays for himself. 
which is good news. It tells us it's okay to pray for yourself. You know, he prays for himself four things. In verse 1, he says, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. So he prays that the father will glorify him and that he will in turn glorify the father. Now, I need to be very clear here. We are not Jesus. We are not little Jesuses, as somebody said one time. Jesus is the only begotten, capital S, Son of God. He has, I would think, a unique relationship with the Father. However, the Bible says that we, when we accept Christ, are adopted into the family and as such are children of God. And so the things that Jesus prays as the capital S Son of God, I believe we should learn from as the children of God. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Which leads me to ask myself, am I doing everything I do to the glory of God? Jesus said, Father, I want to glorify you. That should be our prayer. Father, I want to glorify you. And then he says in verse 4, I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. He says, Father, I have finished the work. I've completed the work you gave me to do. Now, that's kind of a staggering statement because not everybody was healed. Not everybody was a believer. In fact, in a matter of hours, he's going to be betrayed and then crucified. So, you know, not everybody had accepted him, but he had accomplished the work the Father sent him to do because gathered around him were a group of disciples who were committed to him, who would in coming days and weeks and months and years turn the world upside down for the gospel. Which leads me to ask a question to me, am I doing the work God put me here to do? Am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I impacting someone for God? Am I making a difference in somebody's life for God? That's what he's put me here to do, to glorify him, to do the work he's put me here to do, which includes showing the love of God, showing the grace of God to those in my life. Now, I'm not responsible for the whole world, but I am responsible for what I can do in my world, in my sphere of influence. And I need to ask myself, could I say at the end of my life to God, I have finished the work you put me here to do? He says in verse 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me. They were yours. You gave them to me. They have obeyed your word. I have revealed you. We talked last week about the interruption of Jesus in John chapter 14 when Judas, not the Judas Iscariot, said, Lord, how are you going to reveal yourself to us? And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And my father and I will love you and will reveal ourselves to you and make our home with you. And he says in verse 6, through their obedience, they have obeyed your word. I have revealed you to them. Remember that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. God is like Jesus. And we who call ourselves followers of Christ, have the responsibility to give an accurate picture of what God is like. I remember years ago, I probably guess decades ago now, but at least years ago, I'm sure it was Mike came over to the house and said, we need to get you online. And probably knowing his generosity, probably brought a modem over. And um, I'll never forget. You know, it was back in the dial-up days. You know, y'all still have your AOL discs. You know, back in the dial-up days, where you, you that modem would call that number, and you'd hear all these clicks and sounds and dial tones and things. That was the most exciting thing I'd ever heard in my life. What in the world? And then all of a sudden, is welcome. Oh, you know, and it's like, wow. And in those early days, nothing was really real time. You know, there were message boards 
where you could post something and a few days later somebody could read it and post back. And one of the boards Mike pointed me to that I joined was a religion board. And it was a fascinating experience. I wish I could recreate that. I'm sure there's a way to do it now. But the world has gotten so insane since then. But it was, a, a, it was actually, for the most part, a very respectful discussion of various world religions. And I had some fascinating discussions with a rabbi's wife, with a Buddhist from California. And it was just fascinating to sit and talk about faith. And I'll never forget, one day the message came across, if those of you who call yourselves Christians would act more like Christ, maybe the rest of us would believe you better. What do you say to that? <laughs> Except, ouch, you know? And, and I've come to know, and you probably have known people too, who are not followers of Christ because they have such a warped concept of who God is that I wouldn't follow him either if that's who I thought he was. And so we have that responsibility to giving people an accurate representation of who God is. Because, as the songwriter said, you're the only Jesus some will ever see. You're the only Bible some will ever read. And so it's important that we give an accurate picture of what God is like. And then in verse 8, he said, I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I have given them your words. And he says, those words they knew came from you, because they knew I came from you. The teachings of God are unlike any other teachings. They are from God himself. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration of God. And Jesus says, my disciples have paid attention to your words and they followed them. How important it is that we respect the word of God and we give it the respect it deserves. Now, I'm not saying that you have to follow this procedure in your home. But I remember when I grew up as a representation of the respect that the Bible had, we never put anything on top of the Bible. If there was a stack of books, the Bible was always the one on top. You never put, you know, you never used the Bible as a stand to put something on. It was the Bible. It was God's word. And you gave it that respect. Now, again, that's just a symbol. But what about in our lives? Do we give the word of God the respect that it deserves. Well, as Jesus continues to pray, he comes to verse 9, and he's talking about his disciples, and he says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. And then if that's not staggering enough, in verse 20 he says, my prayer is not for them, the disciples alone, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. So here, in the balance of the prayer, starting in verse 9, Jesus prays for us. And that's an incredible thing, that Jesus is praying for us. Now, sometimes in our lives, we can't quite figure out what we're supposed to be doing, what our purpose is, what our mission is in life. Um, <laughs> there's a Peanuts comic strip where Charlie Brown says to Lucy, what's the meaning of life? And Lucy says, life is like a cruise ship. Some people unfold their deck chair and look at the back of the boat to see where they've been. Others unfold their chair and sit it up at the front, always looking ahead. The question, Charlie Brown, is which way is your chair set up? And Charlie says, I can't get my chair unfolded. You know? <laughs> and maybe sometimes that's the way I feel, right? I, 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 don't, I can't even get it unfolded. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, in this prayer, Jesus tells us what we're supposed to be doing. The first thing he says in verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you've given me, 
because you loved me before the creation of the world. The first thing that Jesus prays is that we would sense and experience and see the glory of God. Now, what in the world does that mean? What is the glory of God? Well, there, there's two different words used in the Bible translated glory. One means substance that brings satisfaction. The other means the presence of God. So you could combine those to have a working definition of the glory of God as the substance that brings satisfaction that comes because of the presence of God. So what Jesus is really praying is, I want them to know my presence. I want them to know the substance of life, the satisfaction of life that comes from my presence with them. I believe it was St. Augustine who said that there is a God-shaped vacuum in the soul of man, and man will never be at peace until he finds his peace with God. That's, that's a loose paraphrase of what he said, but it's true. People search all kinds of ways to find what only can come through the presence of God, because he created us in his image. And so you have people with the most expensive automobiles, living in the most expensive homes, with what seems to be a perfect family, going through life saying, surely there's more to it than this. Because the only way you can find substance that satisfies is through the glory, the presence of God. And he says, Lord, I want him to know my glory. I want him to know my presence. In verse 14, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world any more than I am of the world. That ought to kind of assure us, you know, as more and more Christians are being hated in our world. Uh, the world hated them because they're not of this world. I have given them your word. In verse 6, remember, he said, they have obeyed your word. In verse 8, he says, I gave them the words you gave me. They accepted them. Jesus prays that we will follow the word of God, that we will be obedient to his word. We are living in a world where, by and large, people don't think there's any objective standard of right and wrong. And as a result of that, we're in the confused chaos that we're in. We who believe that the word of God is the word of God understand there is an objective standard for behavior. There's an objective standard of right and wrong contained in the Bible, the Word of God. Uh, you'll see a bumper sticker every once in a while that says, God said it, that settles it, I believe it. Well, that's got, uh, it says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's got one too many sentences in it. It should say, God said it, that settles it. Because whether or not I believe it, whether or not I like it, whether or not I accept it, if God said it, that settles it. And part of the challenge of trying to present the Word of God so that people understand it is that people won't always like what they understand. You know, it's like, wait a minute. And, and <coughs> Mark Twain said one time, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that gives me trouble. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that gives me trouble. We can identify with that. More than once in my ministry, I've sat across my desk from somebody saying, I wish I could tell you something else, but this is what the Bible says. You know, I actually told one person one time, I wish that wasn't what the Bible said. It would make things a lot easier, but this is what the Bible says. And we have to decide if we're going to live by what the Bible says. Then in verse 21, he starts to really pray something significant, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. 
He prays that we'll be united in the love of God. Now, that's a whole other sermon of what unity is as far as a Christian goes. I'm just going to give you a little bitty Cliff Notes version. Unity is not uniformity. Unity does not mean we all look the same, dress the same, you know, act exactly the same, like the same music, use the same translation of the Bible. That's not what unity is. Now, there are a lot of places where that's what unity is to them. It's like a cookie cutter. You come into their organization unique with your own personality and everything, and, and by the time they're finished with you, everybody looks the same, everybody talks the same, everybody wears the same hairdo, everybody wears the same style of clothes, and they can tell by looking at you, oh, you go to that place. Well, that's not unity. Unity is not being a cookie cutter. Unity is having the same goal. <clears throat> and Paul tells us in Ephesians 4 how to get there. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort, because it's hard work, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He says, be humble. Now, basically, biblical humility is recognizing I have to depend on God. I can't do it myself. I must depend on God. And then gentleness is looking out for other people, putting other people first. You know, that's a key to unity, putting someone else first. And then being patient with one another, putting up with one another. Yes, even in church sometimes, you got to put up with one another. And then he says, make the effort to keep unity. And I think basically a simple way to do that is to say, focus on what unites us, not what divides us. We come from a lot of different church backgrounds in our church. We could have a church split every other week if we focused on the things that we disagreed about. But we've decided to focus on Christ and focus on what we have together. And Jesus says that this unity will let the world know that Jesus came from God. And just maybe, part of the reason why so many people don't believe in Jesus is because they see the hatred and animosity between people who all call themselves Christians. When I was thinking about unity, maybe one of the best illustrations of it is an orchestra playing a piece of music. Every instrument has their own music. It's written in a different way. Have you ever seen drum music? There actually is drum music. I have no, I, I can't read that. I have no idea what the different lines and asterisks and different things mean, but a drummer knows. You know, and the violin music is different than the trumpet music, and that's different than the trombone music, and that's different than the strings, and that's different, you know, and every piece of every instrument is playing something different. They're not playing the same notes. They're not playing the same rhythms sometimes. But yet, when every piece in that orchestra is on the same page, playing the same measure, doing what they're supposed to do, is beauty. And that's unity. Every one of us, within our own unique personalities, our own unique skills, our own unique gifts, working together for the glory of God. That's what unity is. And then he says in verse 18, As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. He prays that we will go forth in the mission of God. As you sent me, Father, I have sent them. God sent Jesus to earth on a mission. Jesus has put us on earth for a mission. The mission, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we call it the Great Commission. As you go, make disciples. The purpose of the church is not for us to just sit here and talk about how wonderful it is to be a follower of God. The purpose of church is that we gather here, we are trained, we are encouraged, we pray for one another, and then we go out into the traffic patterns of our daily lives to share the good news of Jesus and his love. That's the mission he's put us here to do. What we talked about a few minutes ago, letting the world know who Christ is by his beauty in our lives. Now, if we do these things, if we will have the glory of the presence of God in our lives, if we're obedient to the word, if we're united in love, 
if we're active in the mission, then verse 13 will be accomplished. He says, I am coming to you, Father, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. That's an incredible thing. He prays that we will experience the joy of God, the full measure of his joy. And I really believe that as we do these things that he prayed for, we will have that joy. If we will confess our sins and ask Christ to forgive us and come into our lives, and then we have his presence with us, we are obedient to his word because you know the more disobedience there is in your life, the less joy there is in your life. If we will be obedient, if we will be united with one another, because you also know the more strife there is, the less joy there is. And if we'll be active doing what God has called us to do, we will experience the full expression of God's joy in our lives. I, I read a, a collection of sermons by a man named Lloyd John Ogilvie, who at one time was the chaplain of the United States Senate. And he said he had a friend that every time they left each other, his friend would say, whatever you do, don't miss the joy. I like that. Because we're so tense in our world. We're so uptight in our world that we need to experience the joy that comes from that obedient relationship with Christ. I was reading somebody on this prayer, and they said, if you notice something at the end of this prayer, there's no amen. And they said, I think that means Jesus is still praying that for us. I kind of like that. Jesus is still praying for us. And what I want you to get most of all is he made it possible for you to experience the full measure of the joy of the Lord. And the scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Father, thank you for laying out to us in this prayer how we can experience the joy that Jesus gives. Lord, I pray that you would be with each one who has listened today, that we would fulfill the answers to these prayers, that we will do what Jesus prayed we would so that we could experience your joy. And Lord, we're coming into the time of the year where it seems like everybody's so busy and and it, it, it almost kind of seems like there's not a whole lot of holiday spirit right now. And Lord, I just pray that those of us who call ourselves your children would just say so focused on you and so saturated with you that the joy of the Lord would rub off us onto those that we come in contact with. May each person that we interact with feel more positive and feel better because they interacted with us. And whether they knew it or not, they interacted with the Jesus in us. May it be so, I pray. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.